It's time for the three question one for Biochem 11. Let's get going. For what conditions is dantrolene uh, useful? So this can be uh, used for malignant hyperthermia or for neuroleptic malignant syndrome uh, from certain antipsychotic drugs. Next, what are the possible etiology of acute pancreatitis? So bad hits was the mnemonic, which stands for biliary causes, alcohol, drugs, especially those HIV drugs, hypertriglyceridemia and hypercalcemia, I is for idiopathic, T is for trauma, including an ERCP, and S is for scorpion sting, which really never happens. Next question, what cell type releases renin? So these are the JG cells, and that's the juxtaglomerular cells, and they secrete renin in response to decreased blood flow to the kidneys. All right, that's it for the warm-up. Let's get to that lecture now. We already talked a lot about glucose, and in this video, we're gonna talk about some other processes related to sugar metabolism, starting with the hexose monophosphate shunt, or the HMP shunt, also known as the pentose phosphate pathway. So the HMP shunt is essentially a mechanism for generating a very important molecule called NADPH, not NADH, but NADPH. So first let's talk about why NADPH is so important. NADPH is used for synthesizing fatty acids and cholesterol. You need NADPH to generate oxygen-free radicals to kill bacteria in your phagocytes. NADPH is also needed inside red blood cells to protect the red blood cells from oxygen-free radicals. So not only is NADPH used to generate oxygen-free radicals in the phagocytes, it's also used to reduce oxygen-free radicals in red blood cells to prevent damage. And then the fourth reason why you might need NADPH is for the cytochrome P450 enzymes. So four very important reasons why this is such an essential molecule. So how do we get NADPH? Well, we get it through this pentose phosphate pathway, this HMP shunt but there's really only one key step in this pathway that you need to know. So here are the nuts and bolts. You start with glucose 6-phosphate. Remember, when you first bring glucose into the cell, you phosphorylate that glucose with either hexokinase or glucokinase in order to trap it in the cell. So you start with glucose 6-phosphate, and then there are several reactions that take place. The main enzyme you need to know in these reactions is glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, or G6PD. And that enzyme converts glucose 6-phosphate to a sugar called ribulose 5-phosphate. And you also generate NADPH. And you can use that ribulose 5-phosphate to generate PRPP, which is essential for nucleotide synthesis. That provides the ribose backbone in ribonucleic acids. Now let's look at how phagocytes use NADPH to generate reactive oxygen species and free radicals, and then what those free radicals are used for. So this is known as the oxidative burst process, or it's called a respiratory burst. So this takes place inside the phagolysosome, after the phagocyte has engulfed a bacterium or something else it wants to destroy. So in order to generate oxygen-free radicals, you need oxygen molecules, NADPH, and the enzyme NADPH oxidase, which catalyzes the reaction. You should know that enzyme for your test. Now once the phagocyte has made a reactive oxygen species, you can convert that to hydrogen peroxide. And the enzyme that catalyzes that process is called superoxide dismutase. And then a third enzyme, myeloperoxidase, can use hydrogen peroxide to generate hypochlorous acid. So those are three important enzymes for your phagolysosome. NADPH oxidase, superoxide dismutase, and myeloperoxidase. And these three enzymes make those caustic substances that destroy bacteria inside the phagolysosome. Now, back in immunology, we talked about an immunodeficiency disease that was caused by a deficiency of NADPH oxidase. Remember what that was? Chronic granulomatous disease. Because these patients don't have NADPH oxidase, these patients' macrophages can't produce those caustic substances needed to digest bacteria. But the macrophages can take hydrogen peroxide from the environment and use that to kill bacteria. But some organisms, like Staph aureus and also Aspergillus species, make an enzyme called catalase and that turns hydrogen peroxide into water. So patients with chronic granulomatous disease are susceptible to infection by these catalase-positive organisms because these organisms can neutralize the environmental hydrogen peroxide before the phagocytes have a chance to use it against them. Now I said earlier that NADPH was used both to generate reactive oxygen species by the immune system, and it's also used by red cells to neutralize reactive oxygen species like hydrogen peroxide. So a red blood cell will take hydrogen peroxide and convert it into water using the enzyme glutathione peroxidase. Know that enzyme, glutathione peroxidase. It neutralizes hydrogen peroxide by letting it react with reduced glutathione, which we abbreviate GSH. So reduced glutathione is an important antioxidant, just like vitamin C and vitamin E and vitamin A. So you're gonna see that as a recurring theme. 
Reduced glutathione is an antioxidant. So once reduced glutathione has reacted with hydrogen peroxide, it's no longer reduced glutathione. It's been oxidized. So now it's glutathione disulfide, which is GSSG. So now we need to convert that back to reduced glutathione. And the enzyme that does that is glutathione reductase. And that enzyme uses NADPH as an electron donor. Then to keep a steady supply of NADPH around, we need G6PD, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. So all these enzymes are interconnected. So again, for red cells to detoxify hydrogen peroxide, they need reduced glutathione. And then to keep a steady supply of reduced glutathione, they need a steady supply of NADPH. And the enzyme that produces NADPH is G6PD. So what happens if you're deficient in G6PD? Well, you're not going to be able to make NADPH. And that kind of locks up this whole process. Because our red cells need NADPH so much to neutralize reactive oxygen species and to neutralize hydrogen peroxide, that the red cells of patients with G6PD deficiency are going to be particularly susceptible to reactive oxygen species. So substances that would tend to oxidize red blood cells include certain anti-malarial drugs like primaclin and chloroquine, the antibiotic nitrofurantoin, which is rarely used for anything but UTIs, uh, dapsone, which is used mainly for leprosy or maybe PCP prophylaxis, sulfonamides, uh, the antibiotic isoniazid, which is used for TB, naphthalene, which is a chemical found in mothballs, fava beans, so a nice dinner of liver and onions with a side of fava beans is out of the question, and then ibuprofen and high-dose aspirin are possibly problematic, but probably pretty safe at usual doses. So these substances will induce oxidative damage on red blood cells that can't be repaired because there's no NADPH because there's no G6PD. That oxidative damage is going to cause hemolytic anemia. We're going to talk about this again in hematology, but if you look at the peripheral blood smear of a patient with G6PD deficiency, you're going to see Heinz bodies and bite cells. Heinz bodies are little clumps of oxidized hemoglobin that is precipitated within the red blood cells. And then bite cells are red cells that look like somebody came along and took a big bite out of them. So as these abnormal red cells with Heinz bodies pass through the spleen, the macrophages of the spleen recognize them as abnormal, and they literally take a bite out of the cell to remove the Heinz body. So macrophages remove the Heinz bodies, and that results in bite cells. One other thing worth knowing about G6PD deficiency is that it's an X-linked disorder, and it's actually the most common enzyme deficiency that causes disease in humans. Now, there are lots of enzyme deficiencies that cause interesting characteristics, but don't cause an actual disease. This is the most common deficiency that causes a disease. And it's hypothesized that G6PD deficiency may make red cells less susceptible to malaria. Now, there's another enzyme deficiency that we've already discussed that can also result in hemolytic anemia. That was an enzyme deficiency of the glycolytic pathway, like pyruvate kinase deficiency. Now, just to compare these two diseases, if you're deficient in a glycolytic enzyme, the red blood cells can't make ATP, so they're going to lyse and die that way. But in the case of G6PD deficiency, your cells can make ATP, but they can't protect themselves from oxidation. So in order for a red cell to survive, it needs to both process energy and it needs to be able to protect itself. Now we're ready to talk about some of the other sugars that your body can use for energy, other than glucose. So starting with fructose. Fructose is a simple sugar found in plants. I usually think of fructose as being found in fruit. Now, I don't want you to memorize the metabolic pathway for fructose. It's not really important for step one. But it should look fairly familiar because it shares some of the steps with the glycolysis pathway. And I do want you to know the two disorders that arise from this pathway. The first disorder is essential fructoseuria, which occurs when you're deficient in fructokinase. Again, don't get bogged down in the pathway, but do remember that enzyme and the disorder that goes with it. Essential fructoseuria, fructokinase. And because these patients can't break down fructose the normal way, that fructose is going to build up in the blood and then spill into the urine. Other than that, it's a benign disease. With some sugar disorders, the sugar is going to get trapped in the cell and water follows the sugar osmotically and eventually the cell becomes swollen and you get osmotic damage, possibly even cell lysis. But with essential fructoseuria, none of that happens. That's why it's benign. The only problem is that you can't utilize fructose as an energy source, so it's going to spill out into your blood and then into your urine. Another disorder of fructose metabolism is fructose intolerance, which is due to a deficiency of aldolase B. So with aldolase B deficiency, you're going to have an accumulation of fructose 1-phosphate, and you're essentially using up a lot of the phosphates because they're all stuck to fructose. So you're phosphorylating fructose, but then you can't do anything else with it. So you can't take that phosphate off. So that's why this is problematic. As you use up phosphate, you end up inhibiting glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis, which means that you won't be able to correct fasting hypoglycemia. So as a result, 
with fructose intolerance, you're going to have hypoglycemia and vomiting, especially after you consume a lot of fructose or if, after you consume a lot of sucrose, which is table sugar, because sucrose is just a disaccharide, a dimer sugar made of glucose plus fructose. These patients also have liver problems like hepatomegaly and jaundice. And then we treat fructose intolerance by decreasing the intake of both fructose and sucrose. Next, let's talk about galactose. So galactose is another monomer sugar that your body can use, like glucose or fructose. And deficiencies in the metabolism of galactose can also cause problems. Now again, don't memorize this pathway, but I do want you to know two disorders of galactose metabolism and the enzymes associated with them. The first is galactokinase deficiency. So galactokinase deficiency is due to a deficiency of galactokinase. Pretty straightforward. With galactokinase deficiency, you're going to have an accumulation of galactitol. So galactitol accumulates in the blood and it accumulates in the urine in the same way that fructose accumulates in essential fructoseuria. Now, because galactose is accumulating, it can lead to cataracts, especially in infants. We call this infantile cataracts. So the lens of the eye is particularly sensitive to accumulation of sugars. We're going to see that with diabetes as well. But galactosidase deficiency isn't as bad as the next disorder, which is classic galactosemia. Classic galactosemia is due to the absence of the enzyme galactose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase. So galactose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase. And again, you're going to have excess galactose and excess galactitol in the blood and in the urine. You're going to have worse cataracts, plus hepatomegaly and jaundice, failure to thrive, and intellectual disability. Then the treatment is to exclude galactose from the diet and also to exclude lactose because lactose is a dimer sugar made of glucose and galactose. Let's talk about lactose for a minute. Again, lactose is a dimer sugar, a disaccharide sugar. It's found in milk. And the enzyme lactase breaks down lactose into glucose and galactose. And that enzyme lactase is found in the brush border of the small intestine. But if you have lactase deficiency, either because as you get older you just don't make enough lactase, or because you've some disease that transiently damages the brush border and that reduces lactase, but without lactase in the gut, you can't break down that dimer sugar. And your enterocytes can only absorb monomer sugars. They can't absorb dimer sugars. So the lactose remains in the lumen of the gut, and it passes through the small intestine into the colon. Then the bacteria in the colon find that sugar, and they just go nuts. They start consuming all that lactose. And as they consume all that lactose, they make a lot of gas, like CO2 and methane. And all that gas causes bloating and cramping and flatulence. No laughing. And that lactose in the colon also draws water into the colon osmotically. And that's going to cause an osmotic diarrhea. So how do we treat this? Well, you can supplement lactase in your diet. Anytime a patient with lactase deficiency ingests some dairy, they can take a little lactate pill, and that has lactase in it. That's going to help them break down the lactose. Or they can just avoid dairy products altogether. All right, that's it for sugars. Let's go ahead and tackle the end of session quiz. First question. What is the rate limiting step of the pentose phosphate pathway? It's glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, or G6PD. Next, which tissues of the body use the pentose phosphate pathway? So remember, NADPH generated from this pathway is essential for reducing reactive oxygen species, and it's also used in the generation of cholesterol and fatty acids. So this pathway is especially important in red blood cells, in the liver, in the adrenal cortex, and the mammary glands during lactation. Next. Explain why a deficiency of the enzyme that's the rate limiter for the HMP shunt can result in hemolytic anemia. So again, that rate limiting enzyme is G6PD, and that's responsible for generating NADPH. So NADPH is used to produce reduced glutathione, and that's an important antioxidant. So without G6PD, RBCs are going to be more susceptible to oxidative damage, and that leads to hemolysis. Next, what are the symptoms of classic galactosemia? So you're going to see failure to thrive, intellectual disability, hepatomegaly and jaundice, and infantile cataracts. And the last question, what disorder is caused by a deficiency of each of the following enzymes? So a deficiency of galactokinase causes galactokinase deficiency, which is that milder form of galactosemia. Aldolase B deficiency causes fructose intolerance. Lactase deficiency causes lactose intolerance. Galactose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase deficiency causes galactosemia. And the last one is fructokinase deficiency, which causes essential fructoseuria. So, that's it for Biochem 11. These two guys don't get along, but when it comes to education, they are never wrong. Yeah, if you pay attention, you might get an A. They don't like each other, but that's okay, because they are bosom buddies. 
everyone and welcome to the show. I'm Dr. Lewis and unfortunately again, this is Dr. McGinnis. Hello. How are you feeling? I feel fine. Hmm. You look a little pale, your eyes are, I don't know, a little cross-eyed, you're drooling. Wait, hold on. I don't look anything like that. Why does everything out of your mouth have to be complete nonsense? So wait, you're telling me that you don't look like that? No, not even close. That's weird because, you know, every time I think of you, and again, I try not to think about you, the only picture I conjure up is a drooling, cross-eyed albino. Weird. Maybe it's your personality I'm thinking of. You're such a drama queen. I got a question for you. You think your little brain can think about something other than video games and Cheetos for a few seconds? We have Cheetos? Focus, simpleton. What is G6PD deficiency? You mean other than three letters and number and the word deficiency? Yeah. Well, G6PD stands for glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, which is an enzyme involved in the pentose phosphate pathway. And it tends to be very important in maintaining a normal level of glutathione in red blood cells. Now, glutathione is needed to protect RBCs from oxidative damage from free radicals. Now, the deficiency is an X-linked recessive hereditary disease. So patients with it, when stressed by infection or certain drugs uh, like the antimalarials and sulfonamides, or even by certain foods like fava beans, will have non-immune hemolytic anemia. Hmm, how's that? Barely adequate, but it was better than your usual slack-jawed mumbling. Another gem of a lecture by good old Dr. Lewis. That's all for today. See you next time. Bye.